good morning. And welcome this morning to God's worship. Uh, welcome to those who are joining us via live stream. Uh, we're glad that you're with us. Um, we've got lots coming up at, uh, at Bethel over the next uh, few weeks here. The Bethel Women's Fellowship is meeting at 9 a.m. this Saturday in the church conference room. You could uh, contact Rebecca with uh, questions. If you have any questions uh, about the, the meeting, would like to attend. And then we're really looking forward to that uh, Sunday school classes are going to resume on February the 20th, uh, Sunday school for all ages. And uh, I'm going to be teaching the, uh, the new members and inquirers communicants class. That's going to be a kind of a catch-all for, uh, for, for people who want to become members of Bethel Church, for non-communicant members who have grown up in the church and are looking to communicant membership, and for anybody else who would like to attend. We'd be glad to have you. I'd be glad to have you come to that class. Um, then on February the 26th, which is a Saturday from uh, 2 to 4, we're having a February Blues Buster, uh, crafts and fun for all ages from 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, in the fellowship. And so um, kids can come to that, parents can come to that with their kids, you could drop off your kids, um, but just a kind of a time as, you know, we go into the winter doldrums here, the snow starts to melt, everything looks kind of brown and dead, and, uh, and so just a, a time to do something that, uh, that we hope will, will be fun and will encourage you. And then uh, we want to continue to encourage you to mark your calendars for Saturday, March 5th at 7 p.m. Uh, for the presentation, Spirituality in a Minor Key. And um, that's a kind of a story and song event. I've um, been fortunate enough to be able to co-op some friends of mine who are some of the, the top jazz musicians in the Northern Virginia area who are going to be uh, doing the musical portion of that that night. And, uh, and I'm excited about that. So you've got an insert in your bulletin. And uh, we have begun to uh, um, uh, put things up around different places. We have a Facebook event. I think some of you have seen that. In fact, it was uh, exciting that I think that, you know, we've got these Eventbrite tickets on Facebook. Uh, and uh, they don't cost anything, but just so that we can get an idea. And we've got uh, 20, we've sold. 25 tickets of people whose names we don't recognize. Nobody knows who they are. So, um, but let me tell you that the best way that you can um, have people come out to this, that we can have people come out to this is, first of all, for you to come yourself, and then secondly, to take this. We've got others, if you'd like them, and use it as an invitation and say to a friend or neighbor, and we'd really like to make it unchurched friends and unchurched neighbors, people um, who, who don't know the Lord, and, uh, and say, hey, I, I think you would enjoy this. If it, I'd like you to come out. Uh, with me to this, and I think they will enjoy it. I think it'll be a wonderful night. I think it'll be good. I think it will be fun. But there's a but there's a mission in this that's beyond just having a good time together. Now, for some of you who have access to community rooms, um, we've got these. I've got I think I got four or five of these larger posters. But we can get more. And so if you have a place where you could uh, hang this up, I've been able to hang these at a few places. The libraries. Uh, around town have taken them. If you've got a community room or something where you're able to hang these up, um, let me know and we'll, we'll be sure to get you some of these. Let's turn our attention now uh, to the worship of God and to uh, prepare our hearts for that. We'll just take a few moments of meditation.
Good morning. If you're able to, please rise for the call to worship. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go in and praise the Lord. The word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your word. Let's now praise our God singing um, the red hymnal number 124, Praise the Lord Our God. Let us pray. Father, thank you that you call us into your presence this morning to worship you. Father, when we look at our lives, we see that we truly are unworthy servants, that though we are vessels, we are not vessels in ourselves who are vessels suited for glory. But Father, when we look to your word, we see that throughout history, you have called people to worship you and that you use people, sinful as we are, to yet bring you glory through the blood of your son, Jesus. Father, we ask this morning that you would do the same, that you would work through our words, through our praises, through our prayers, to glorify and to exalt your name. For that is why we are here this morning. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. God is a redeeming God, and we need to understand that as we look at the things that he tells us. When he called the people 
of Israel out of Egypt. And he gave them these words. He said, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. He starts with redemption. And then he says, first and foremost, you will have no other gods before me. You'll not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You will not bow down to them or worship them. He told them that. He tells us that because it's very easy for us to take created things and substitute them for God. We do it without even thinking about doing so. And so as a congregation, let's go together before the Lord and pray the prayer of confession that's printed, and then I'll give you some opportunity to seek the Lord yourself. Let's pray together. Lord, open my eyes to my idols. I easily make idols of good and lofty things, expecting that I can make you after the image I desire. Help me to see you, not as I want you to be, but as you really are. Take a few moments to confess your sins to God. May my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. May my prayer come before you. and Deliver me according to your promise. That was the prayer of the psalmist. I hope that it is your prayer as well. And if it is, and you ask that prayer through Jesus Christ, you can be certain that God will hear and will answer you favorably. The responsive reading this morning is going to be from Psalm 146, and as we read that responsively, one of my favorite lines there is to not have trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. Uh, it's especially good maybe to rem remember around election time, but with the 24-hour uh, news cycle, perhaps we should be reminded of this more often. Uh, with that in mind, let's read Psalm 146 responsively. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will say praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans are uncovered. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow. He frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. May God bless our consideration of his word this morning. The next part of our service is giving back to God his tithes and our offerings. Um, today we'll be doing that as we have the last few weeks. Um, 
not actually passing the plate um, because of COVID. Hopefully we can start doing that relatively soon. Uh, but would encourage everyone on your way out, there are uh, plates in the back. You can put your tithes and offerings in there. And um, if you're worshiping online, we also have an online option to, to give there as well. As we um, go through this portion of our service, though, it's, it's always important for us to remember what this is about. Um, I want to tell you a, a brief um, story, which for me, I think, encapsulates some of how we think about this. Um, at one point, I had a student loan that had interesting terms. I would pay back every month, um, but the amount that I would pay back is less than the interest that was accruing on the loan. So every month, even though I was paying, the, the actual size of the loan got larger. Um, not, not great terms, but those were what the terms were. Um, you know, when we think about what we give back to God, and in some ways, it's like that. Um, the parallels aren't all there, but each week, um, the loan that we owe to God, if you will, is growing. We, we come into this world as sinners. Each week, we are adding to that, and there's nothing that we can do to pay back that loan to God, to pay back our sin, and that's not what this is about. This is not about uh, paying back to God, getting um, the ledger right in his book. There's only one person who can do that, and that is Jesus, um, and he offers that freely to everyone who comes to him. The reason we give back now is simply out of love. Um, it's to demonstrate um, thankfulness to him. There's, again, nothing that we can do to, to repay him. But it is good and right that we should show our appreciation, our love for him. And so as we take the next few minutes, think about that as we're approaching God, as we give back to God his tithes and our offerings. Um, what is the mindset that you have? And where we have error there, let's, let's use this time to confess that and to ask him to change our hearts. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the gift that you give us in Jesus. Thank you that you don't call us each week to, to repay our debt, to repay our sin, that you, through his blood, have given that freely to us as a gift. Father, we ask that what we give back would be useful for your kingdom, that we wouldn't give back only money, but we would give back our entire lives, our mindsets, our, our time, our relationships, that, Father, you would use each of these things to bring your name glory and to extend your kingdom. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Friends, let us now confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed, the faith that we share with our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. I believe in God the Father, almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And please be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we come into your presence today rejoicing, rejoicing at the word we've already heard, the reminder that Jesus has paid for our sins, that the debt that we owe to you, O oh God, is not the debt of our sin, but the debt of love. And Father, we thank you that your word has told us that Jesus came into the world, we're told at the very start of the gospel, came into the world to save his people, not from the Romans, but from their sins. And Lord, you have taken away the liability of our sin in Jesus, but your word tells us that we are being saved that we're being delivered from our sins. So, Father, by your word and your spirit today, enable us more and more to die to our sin, to die to our selfishness, to die to our self-justification and excuses. Open our eyes to see your kingdom. And help us, Father, to make it the first and foremost priority of our lives, knowing that all of those things which gain the attention of the world and occupy us so easily, you'll freely give to us. Our Father, we pray for the coming of your kingdom. And Father, we would begin by praying for our foreign missionaries, for Mike and Lili, uh, laboring in the U.S. for the church in China. Lord, thank you for uh, the ordination of one man in the presbytery there, that there are six more who have been approved for ordination. Father, we pray for the logistics to meet for this purpose in each uh, case. Um, the, the pandemic and other obstructions in China have created a backlog in the process. But Lord, you know the needs of your people. And so we pray that you would provide for them. And we thank you for the, for the steadfastness, for the faithfulness, for the courage of your people there. We pray too for Mike's labor in Ohio with the Asian University students. And we particularly pray for one of those students who has shown great interest in the Bible studies. We pray that that God would open that young man's heart, that he would receive the truth of the gospel. Lord, we pray for our uh, home missionaries, Greg and Ginger O'Brien, laboring in uh, Downingtown, Pennsylvania, and for the uh, newly planted Christ Church, as they seek to encourage several new members and visitors and are encouraged by them. And Father, we thank you for the growth that has taken place there. We pray for the efforts of that congregation as they seek ways to bring God, the gospel to the community. Um, we pray for Pastor Greg's involvement with other fathers through a local sports team there. Uh, Father, we pray that you would give them many such opportunities. And Father, we pray for our own efforts in making strangers into friends and friends into disciples of Jesus. And uh, Lord, I'm excited about this opportunity coming up next month. And, uh, and, and the people already who are unchurched people who are interested in coming and, and through that will gain some uh, introduction to the gospel. 
thank you, Father, for that. And we pray that your blessings for success will be upon that event. We begin to pray now, Lord, as uh, March can be an unpredictable weather month, that you would um, see to it, our Father. We, we pray for your kindness, that there would be no uh, difficulties or issues with the weather. And Father, we pray for our um, church ministries. We pray for our ladies' Bible study and Deb Sane as she leads that group in prayer and in the study of the word uh, each time they meet. And for those women who attend, that they would grow as disciples of Jesus in the bonds of fellowship and love for one another. And Father, we lift before you the ministry of Loudoun Christian Justice Mission um, and for our brother Brian Lynch who is involved in it. We uh, pray for those who are uh, residents or incarcerated at the Loudoun Adult Detention Center uh, as the volunteers there minister to those men and women through group Bible studies and through one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And Father, we pray that uh, you will use them to open hearts and change lives through Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, you've told us that we should pray for our daily bread, for the things that we encounter day by day that we need. And so, Father, uh, we would pray today for those who are mourning. We continue to pray for the Martin family and their extended family as they mourn the loss of John. Uh, Father, we continue to pray for healing for our dear sister Emily as she recovers from her surgery. We praise you with her that no further signs of cancer were found. Father, we also want to uh, pray for many who have been affected uh, by this virus. We thank you for your kindness to us in this church. And Father, we uh, mourn with those who have recently lost people to this virus. We pray, Father, that you would bless and comfort that family. And we ask, Father, your mercy that you would lift this scourge from us soon. Uh, Lord, we pray for the um, marriages, the new marriages in our church, the, the, the upcoming marriage of Nathan and Marjorie, and pray that you would uh, bless and prepare them to spend their lives together serving you, that they would grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus because of that relationship, and that you'd bless them greatly. And Father, we pray your blessing upon uh, Noah and Laura, and as uh, Father, we were able to rejoice with them in their wedding ceremony. Um, now that they're married and Noah has had to go back to Germany, uh, Father, we, we pray that you would be gracious to both of them in this time of separation as uh, they're getting the housing set up there, as Noah's obtaining housing. And pray that you'd bless and keep him, watch over and protect him, and bless and keep and watch over Laura and protect her too. And Father, if there are today among your people unexpressed concerns, heartache, fear, anxiety, worry, we pray, Father, that in the quietness of their hearts as your people make those things known to you, that you would fill them with your spirit, that you, O oh Lord, would undertake to comfort them, for you are our Father, and you love us greatly. You'll not leave us or forsake us. You promised us that when we go through difficult things, you will go with us and you will provide for us in all that we need. Lord, for all of these things, we give to you thanks and praise. We offer them to you in confidence because of who Jesus is and what he has done. We pray in his name as he has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to hear the word proclaimed this morning, let's rise together and sing hallelujah, praise Jehovah, O my soul.
Please be seated. Is warmer weather coming? Is it supposed to be warmer next week? You, you people are no help. And when you read the New Testament, as you read through the New Testament, have you ever wondered what it's like, what it would be like to be there? Have you ever kind of put yourself there and said, I wonder what it would have been like to hear Jesus of Nazareth speak or to listen to his teaching or to see the things that he did? Uh, to witness the alternating adulation and hatred of him and, and wonder if you would have the courage to stand with him when he was unpopular and hated. Have you ever imagined being there and Jesus looking at you and saying, what do you want me to do for you? You might say, I don't know if Jesus would say something like that, but in fact, the gospel accounts record two such instances in which Jesus asked people that very question. What do you want me to do for you? How would you answer him? If you could change something right now, right? If you could change something in this world right now, I'm shy of saying, you know, come back now, but you could change something right now, what would it be? If you could, if you could ask him to change something, what would it be? The answer that you give to that question will be telling as to how well you understand who Jesus is and how well you understand yourself. Last week, we looked at Jesus feeding the 5,000 with the help of his disciples. 5,000 men were told. And so I'm going to pick up and read from John chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. It's right after that event. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. And Father, we pray today that you would open our eyes, our ears, our hearts by your Holy Spirit to hear your word, that, Lord, it would do its work within us, that its roots would grow deeply in us, and we would bear fruit upward to you. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Jesus is Lord on his terms, not on ours. If I had to sum up the teaching of John chapter 6, that would be it. Jesus is Lord on his terms, not on yours and not on mine. He's Lord on his terms. Now, as the chapter progresses, that's going to become more and more evident, but it's evident right here at the start. Jesus is Lord. You can't make him Lord. Many people try. You know, sometimes we're exhorted to do that, right? Have you heard people say that? Well, you should make Jesus Lord. You should make Jesus Lord of your life. Make Jesus, Lord. And I think I know what they're trying to say when they say that, but I don't know if it's helpful. It really is the stuff of the American church and particularly the modern evangelical church. And it's why whatever the outward trappings of any church may be, why true spirituality and true concern for the kingdom of God throughout the, the whole land are at a low ebb. The people who try to make Jesus Lord recognize that there's something 
indeed that's special about him, and the people here did. After they saw the miraculous signs that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. He's the prophet who has come into the world. Now, what they're referring to is something that we read in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 18, where God said to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command you. And there was a general understanding uh, in the first century at this time among the Jews that this prophet was the Messiah. He was the son of David who was to come, the one who was like Moses. And in fact, we find out as we read the rest of the New Testament that they were correct in thinking that. And so they see Jesus do these things. They say, surely this is the prophet coming into the world. And they recognize him as a viable candidate for the Messiah. But I think that's how they recognized him as a viable candidate. You have to understand that at this time, there were many people who arose claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to be someone. They draw followers after themselves. Jesus looked like a viable candidate for that position. And so they intended to come and make him king, to make him Lord by force. You know, you think about that here. We're told that there were 5,000 men who were there. Specifically says men. There are probably women and children too, but 5,000 men. And can you imagine what most people would do if all of a sudden you were surrounded by 5,000 men who said, we're ready to follow you. And we want you to be king. And what could they accomplish? Boy, it seems like it's all Jesus would have to do is speak the word. The problem is found in the words they wanted to make him king. We read in Matthew's gospel at Christmas time that the, that the Magi came from the east and they had a question. They said, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews. In other words, they didn't come to make him king. They recognized that he was king, and they came to honor him such. They didn't come to make him king. They came to honor him as king, to recognize him as king. And the intention of the crowd here to make him king is telling. You know, worldly leaders, political leaders, they have more or less integrity, but none of them have total integrity. Because they depend to a greater or lesser degree, depending on what the government uh, of the nation is like, they depend to a greater or lesser degree on the, on the goodwill of the people to retain their power, to retain their authority, to retain their office, at least some group of people. You know, you would have to be blind, you'd have to be blind not to notice that Democrats in Congress look very different than Democrats in Congress 15 years ago. And you'd have to be blind not to notice that Republicans in Congress today look very different than Republicans 15 years. It's not because there's a new crop of them. Some of them have been there for decades. And yet sometimes when you compare the video from some of them 15 years ago with what they say today, they look like it must be a different person with the same face and voice because the things that they say are so radically different. And, and there's an incestuous pandering that takes place in which politicians rile up the worst instincts of their supporters and then must play to them in order to retain their support. 
It's why in the end, all nations, all governments, no matter how well they start, always destroy themselves in the end. But Jesus doesn't need followers to make him king. He is king. And nothing that you or I do will ever change that. Follow him or not, he is king. Support him or not, nothing in all the universe will change that fact. And we'll see at the end of chapter 6 that Jesus will not sell himself for popularity. He's willing for absolutely everyone to walk away from him. He does not care. He has no need to. Worldly leaders are harmed or helped by the support that's given them or withheld from them. Jesus is not. You cannot make Jesus Lord. He is Lord. The question for you and for me is do we accept him as such? Do we bow to him as Lord, or do we, as these people here, try to press him into our agendas and so make him Lord? Now, you know, it's telling that when they do that to Jesus, what he does is withdraw from them. I have a suspicion that the reason for the spiritual state, whatever its outward trappings are today, the reason for the spiritual state of the American evangelical church is that Jesus has withdrawn from them because they're trying to make him Lord. And it's the uh, reason for and the result of the frantic impotence of churches today as they try to retain their cultural dominance or stay relevant. Jesus must be received for who he is or not at all. It's not so with worldly leaders. They're received only for who people want them to be. Their power comes from popularity. You know, in 2012, there was a certain U.S. senator who ran for president. I spoke with a couple that was supporting him at the time. They told me that he was the most principled politician in Washington, D.C. In fact, to hear them speak, you know, uh, he had nothing on George Washington. He was the most principled man who ever lived. Eight years later, the same man was a political hack who never had an ounce of integrity in his life. Wow, how did that happen? Well, because he voted in a way that they didn't like and didn't want him to vote. An acceptance of worldly leaders is based upon whether he's doing or she's doing what I want them to do. That's what these people were hoping to achieve by making Jesus king. And everyone who seeks to make Jesus Lord or make Jesus King is hoping for the same. Timothy Keller has pointed out that if Jesus never convicts you of your sin, never says things that upset or anger you, never says things that frighten you if you were to actually do them, never demands of you that you change the way you think or the things you do, you're worshiping a Jesus of your own imagination. And much of American Christianity is worshiping a Jesus of its own imagination, a Jesus who is tame and safe for them. A Jesus who does what they want him to do. I could cite instances, almost without number, of such a Jesus of the Democrats. But there's not much danger that any of you would fall prey to that Jesus. The danger that threatens you is worth worshiping the Jesus of the Republicans. 
You know, whatever else the Pharisees and Sadducees were, they were political parties. The Sadducees were clandestinely comfortable with Roman rule. They benefited from it. It couldn't be openly so because, well, that would uh, cut into the goodwill of the people toward them. The Pharisees carefully opposed Roman rule. Philosophically, they were in line with the Zealots, but they, but they didn't want to be on the outskirts of society like the Zealots. Whose side was Jesus on? Times he seemed to be on the side of the Pharisees. Jesus affirmed the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. But Jesus affirmed it, so I guess he's on the side of the Pharisees. Well, hold on. Times he seemed to be on the side of the Sadducees. Jesus affirmed the divine authority of the scriptures alone. Rejected, we see in Matthew 5, rejected the oral tradition or oral Torah, as the Pharisees called it, as being God's word, as being authoritative. So, well, now he appears to be aligned with the Sadducees. The truth is, Jesus is on the side of neither the Pharisees nor the Sadducees, but at times they may appear coincidentally to be on his. It's a telling account in Joshua chapter 5, back in the Old Testament. The armies of Israel are standing outside of the city of Jericho. And, and Joshua gets sight of a man there, standing there with a sword. Um, theologians, biblical scholars debate who this figure is. Is he uh, an angel of the Lord? Is he a theophany of Christ, the Son of God, before his incarnation? And I don't know the answer to that in definitive term, but I'll tell you, the interchange is interesting. That, that Joshua sees this man, doesn't know who he is, standing there with a sword. He goes up to him and he says, are you for us or are you for our enemies? Do you, do you know or do you remember the answer that he gave? He said, neither. But as the captain of the Lord's army, I have now come. Let me ask you again, are you among those who receive Jesus as Lord? Or among those who try to make him Lord? There may be times that some of the concerns of the Democratic political party coincidentally align with some of the teaching of Jesus. There may be times that some of the concerns of the Republican political party coincidentally align with the teaching of Jesus. Do not make the mistake of thinking that Jesus is on either of their sides, nor that either of them are on the side of Jesus. We don't always know our hearts very well. There's an easy test in that regard as to whether we're making Jesus Lord to serve an agenda, particularly when it comes to political things. It's a good thing for you to ask yourself in the, in the a quiet reflection this afternoon. If you defend everything a particular political party does, regardless of what it is, and you decry everything that the other political party does, regardless of what it is, you're seeking something first other than the kingdom of God. Today there is a rampant idolatry in the American evangelical church. It's a bargain that says to politicians, if you will stand with us on this issue, we will compromise with you on that one. We will look the other way on that one. And the real Jesus will have none of it. You know, James reminded us that the danger is real. He wrote, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. 
we think somehow that uh, we can co-opt at least some little segment of the world to be on our side, to be a friend of grace, to help us to God. But the Bible tells us otherwise. What do you want me to do for you? Let me return to that question. What do you think you need most? Short of the Lord's return, if Jesus were to ask you that, what do you want me to do for you? What what do you think you would say? What needs to change? The Gospels record two instances when Jesus asked that question. And in one case in Mark chapter 10, they're back to back. He asks it the first time to his disciples, James and John. And their answer was, Grant us to sit at your right hand and your left when you come into your glory. In other words, their desire was for position and power. You know, we've been oppressed, we've been trampled down, and what we need is position and power. Was a desire that their circumstances be changed, and it did not receive a favorable response from Jesus. The other is recorded a few verses later to a blind man. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. His request was not that his situation be changed. His request was that he be changed. And that did receive a favorable response from Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? If your answer is about changing the situation, you want to make him Lord. If your answer is, Lord, I want to be changed, you bow to him as Lord. The only answer to that question that receives a favorable response from Jesus is, Lord, I want to see. Open my eyes to my idolatry, to my compromise, to my hope in princes, and help me really to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Because Jesus didn't come to vindicate you in your self-righteousness and change others. He came primarily to change you. You can't make Jesus Lord. Jesus is Lord. And he's Lord on his terms, not on ours. Father, grant to us hearts that would truly seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. That, Father, we would uh, not dally with the trinkets of the world, but that we would know that our citizenship is in heaven, that we would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, even when it seems inexpedient to do so, believing your promise that you will add to us all that we need. And Father, as you do that in our hearts, may you use us to change the hearts of people that you might redeem and gather together a people for yourself. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. If you're able to, would you please rise and we'll sing verses 2 and 3 from the Red Hymnal 573.
So let me uh, remind you, I, I think that we're, we're going to have our fellowship time downstairs, okay, so the fellowship time downstairs. I have a, a quick meeting with people I've sent emails to uh, about the event on, uh, on March 5th. Um, you've got these in your bulletin. If you need more, let me know, but make personal invitations to friends and Really, my hope is that it would be uh, unchurched friends, people uh, who don't have any exposure to church and to the gospel. For some of you who came in uh, late, we've got, we've got larger of these, so if you've got a community room or something where you live someplace that you could put these up, um, ask me and I'd be gl glad to let you have one. But really, I think the most effective way uh, that, uh, that we're going to reach people is to say to friends, hey, I I think that you would enjoy this. Uh, why don't you come out with me? You know, this past week as I was going around um, putting up some, asking if we could put up flyers in different places, the posters and the libraries and things, I, I went into a, a business. I know the business owner there. Um, and, I, and I asked him if, uh, if, if I could post it. And he said, sure. And I said, hey, I'd, you know, have the small one. I said, I'd, I'd like to invite you. I think that you'd really enjoy it. And uh, he didn't answer that question, but he told me, he said, you know, I've got a, he said, I've got a, a, a fellow that I know. He said he's a, um, he, he's a religious guy. He talks about Jesus all the time. But he's the most selfish guy that I know. His, his reason for talking about Jesus is because Jesus justifies everything that he does. All he does is talks about how Jesus came to give him his rights, and he's got his rights and he really doesn't care about anybody else. And it's interesting, because this guy's a very um, compassionate, giving person, and I, and I got the point of what he was telling me. I, I really don't want a, a, any part of that when I see, you know, what Christianity is like. And so I sent him the next day, I sent him a text, and I just want to read it to you. I said, hey, it was great catching up with you the other day and hearing about your trip. Thank you for posting our event. I keep thinking about the religious guy you told me about. I didn't grow up in a religious home, but at the tail end of the Jesus movement of the 70s, I became a follower of Jesus. It's really distressing to me to see people using claims of faith in him to promote their own selfishness. We're naturally inclined to being selfish anyway, but Jesus came to change us so that we'd no longer be selfish, not so that we could justify our own selfishness. Anyway, the whole thing just bothered me, and I wanted to say I was sorry that you encountered that. And, you know, he responded to that with a thank you. And I think there's some more discussions to come. And he might actually come to the event. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And when you go out into your week, be the reason that someone loves Jesus not the reason why people hate Christians. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Mm -hmm.